tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, tēnā koutou katoa, e hoa mā, e rauranga tira mā, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou. I've been set up. After one, day two, upstage. Yeah, I was even, I've never done this, but I wrote out what I was going to say, because I was, Utterly traumatised by 15 minutes. I normally just stand up here and wave my arms around, which I'll sort of try and do. Uh, it's been interesting sitting here for two days. There's a whole lot of stuff that's been said which is echoes, at least for me, in, in my presentation. Um, and it's been quite collegial and it's been quite consensual, and I hope to disrupt that somewhat. I hope to provoke some of you, I hope I'll piss some of you off. Um, relieve some of you and, and maybe inspire some of you. But it's my view that despite the immense contribution design has made to New Zealand, we have to do a whole lot more. And we have to do it in an area that, in my observation, we're not comfortable with. And we actually have to reinvent the way we do it to do it well. Uh, now, right, this challenge. Okay. Just so that you don't. You, I think I'm not just an opinionated wanker. Um, <laughs> I'd like to just tell you a little bit about how I came to these views. And I've had a fabulous, accidental, magical ride through design, which happened so for me in 1983 when I suffered the opportunity to take st a stake in a furniture company called Formway. And I was there for 16 years, and in that period, um, we moved this company from a tin pot little RC into the World Furniture Company. And in the last 12 years of my time there, my main role was actually building the capability in that organisation to produce the world leading chairs that they're now renowned for. And that gave me an uh, exposure to product design, furniture design, workplace design, ergonomics, interiors, and that whole thing, the whole design of organisations, the whole design of business thing. Uh, through another happy accident, I took that to DNA, which is a large design consultancy, Open Wellington, 50 odd people at the moment. And we've been evolving and re evolving our practices over the last 16 years. And that's further exposed me to branding and digital and communications design and service design. And most recently, really interestingly, into design for social innovation and design for public policy. So, an enormous um, span of these things. But I actually started before that as a, a teacher and, a, and an activist for Te Reo Māori. And when I left that world to go to Formway, all my colleagues from then thought I had deserted the ship and gone to the dark side. But it's really bloody fascinating how those two worlds, my two worlds, have collided. And that over the last um, 10 or so years, a whole range of what we've been doing, and I think Miriam there was the, probably the start of one of these, have been designed from my design background in the Māori world. And I want to come back to that theme a bit later on. But having been able to experience all of those things, you, can, you get a quite visceral understanding of where design is and where it's going to. Ugly graphic, I'm sorry, but um, people talk about this design for, designing for people as being a natural home. And as we move out across that range of Mo, uh, mediums, if you like, or modes or contexts, moving into designing with people and ultimately setting up people to design for themselves. That whole uncomfortable zone of design thinking. Now, it seems to me that we are most comfortable not only when we are driving that design process, but also when we are the acknowledged owners of the craft that is relevant to that domain whether it be typography or product or prototyping or whatever. And that as you move over into this design with and taking people into design by, we drop off that ability to control the craft. We simply become still champions of the process, but then facilitators. Now, I've heard a number of designers uh, talk about that and saying, when you go over there, it's not really design. But not controlling the craft, without craft you're no longer designers. Now, that may be true, it may not. 
I think it's just unhelpful semantics. So then we've got the efficient prime. Just to touch on that process, and these are echoes from what everyone else has said. In my experience, the process is utterly common across all of those strands of design that I've been involved with. And it really is just where empathy and imagination and agility are carefully managed to produce a, a solved problem or a resolved or trans transformed situation. Where agility stands for that uh, conscious, continual re-evaluation, empirical look at results-driven reassessment of your goals, your approaches, and your priorities. So, okay. I think New Zealand is not thriving. I think we're demonstrably fucked, actually. <laughs> and I think we've been uh, sort of ignoring that, or maybe touching on it, but not really digging into it. And I think that's the problem that design really has to look at. To thrive, I think we have to do three things. We really have to generate wealth. We have to make our living in the world to fund a civilised society. Things like uh, health, education, systems that make sense, uh, good infrastructure, a, 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 a comprehensive social safety net. We also have to look after our environment, which is our prime asset. So much of what we rely on comes from that source. And finally, we have to build social cohesion. Now, making a living in the world is actually quite hard, and it's only going to get harder over time. And as our age demographics increase and the dependency ratio increases, actually, each one of our productive employees has to be so much more productive than they used to be. And that is a real design challenge. Um, looking after our environment, we have to deal with the fact that there's going to be so many more of us. We're putting so much more development pressure on it, intensifying uh, agriculture. Oh, and climate change. <laughs> and these two things are not unrelated. And I want to acknowledge the fact that design has made probably enormous contributions to that. Like, in my memory, it seems, I think, it's, and Michael Smythe can correct this, it must be about 50 years since the first industrial design course from Wellington, right here, started. You were on it. <laughs> and, um, and certainly it, the things that have been achieved, and certainly at Formway, for example, in the 80s, it was a bloody lonely business being a design-led company. And that's certainly not the case now. And a lot of that, I think, was, for our case, anyway, just due to tapping into the talent from that generation, people like Mark Pennington, particularly, and all of the other graduates that come out of there. So education is a place, one place where you can start to solve these problems. It's a very long, burning thing, but uh, it is a place to go. I want to actually focus in on uh, cohesion, social cohesion. Because that, I think, is where we do have to operate. That's where we have to make a contribution to our thriving country. And here we create, face two significant barriers of the rapidly increasing diversity in our country and levels of inequality. Now, when I was born, uh, more than 90% of New Zealanders were like me, um, of largely of European, largely British descent, been here for not that long. In my case, about five generations. Pākehā, in other words. According to statistics, New Zealand, under 40s in 10 years from now, will be majority not like me. I apologise for the baldness of these, and the homogeneity of these titles, they just what stats gather. Equally, already in Auckland, that 55%, Auckland currently is in 47%, identifying those three categories. And 40% of Aucklanders were born offshore. I think it was mentioned the other day. Now, um, if you look around here and any other design community I've been in, we don't represent that demographic. And so that whole thing about empathy uh, probably doesn't come naturally when you think about crossing just an ethnicity or a cultural or a gender or a language barrier. And I think that's a real challenge for us. 
Next one is um, inequality. And the rich and the poor are part of the company in New Zealand at a faster rate than any other developed country. And inequality is bad. It's really bad for a civilised society. In New Zealand, 1% um, of the population controls three times the wealth of the bottom half. And the outcome, well, maybe it's an output, or an impact <laughs> of that. <laughs> we're, uh, we're bringing up a quarter of a million children in poverty. And I think that's just an absolute abomination, because that's a quarter of a million children who we won't have the benefit of as fully participating future citizens supporting me and my old age. <laughs> It's a cost I don't think we can bear. These two things overlap as well. And that where wealth and power exist, it is overwhelmingly white. And when deprivation and poverty exist, it is disproportionately brown. It's not by chance. And if it's not by chance, it's by design. Okay, it's perhaps a big, complex, unconscious design, but nevertheless, these outcomes are what our systems mandate. Uh, someone mentioned Families 100, a piece of research presented in a design format, looking at the reality of poverty in Auckland. And what it is essentially looking at is this zone here where government policy, right from political policy through to operational government policy, service delivery of governments, NGO supports of community action, all sort of interact to form the ecosystem of being poor. And what, in a way, someone said yesterday, you, you read it and weep. It's a read and weep scenario. And I've done a workshop with a whole bunch of civil servants who are public servants, so that's how old I am. Um, working on this, who, who, who did literally read this thing and weep. But it, it utterly damns that whole system as not fit for purpose. It, rather than uh, helping, assisting people out of poverty, it just traps them in there. It makes them work very, very, very hard and have to be very resourceful to even keep your head above ground, but you're trapped there. Now, it's a complex system. It's the accretion of all sorts of bits and pieces put together over time. And there's an enormous uh, acceptance in government. I've spent the first half of this year working on policy and treasury where they absolutely believe this stuff. But is it actually changing? $25 a week on the benefit, which they actually don't get yet, they get in April, is perhaps the only policy response that I've noticed so far. So recognition is not enough. Now, out where that deprivation is real, whether you want to call it the cold face or the grassroots, whatever metaphor you like. Approaches like this with their sort of Silicon Valley, European deep roots, actually don't work. They don't resonate well. They don't touch or um, create that empathy that's required with that largely brown audience. At DNA, and through the vehicle of actually developing up a degree in ZQA qualification in design thinking, a master's degree in design thinking, we've developed a sort of understanding of how it is to work in at least the Māori world. Whereas we work on a project, we park our work on a project, and as a consequence of that, we build a good relationship. What we've discovered, quite simply, you turn that on the head. You need to build the relationship first, and then the work will go. We've turned this into quite a um, sophisticated model. It uh, has four principles. Each of those is the pon of the tahuhu of this whare. The first one out the front is the, the whānau principles. This is that before you even start, you form a relationship, you get to know each other. The Wātū principle means that as you go through into the whare, 
You're accepting certain things, you're taking on board, and you're making clear a whole lot of stuff. Um, inside, the two po at the back, Kōrero and Whakaro, divide the space into four rohe, if you like, which um, te kore, te pō, te whaiao, te aumarama. Now, I'm actually not going to go into that too much, because it's actually, whilst it's good, and I'm half proud of it, it's actually not designed with. It's a piece of design for. And we can do better. Um, this uh, year, and it, and it comes from a, a space that I, I must admit I'm embarrassed about, because I should know better. I ought to know better. I ought to have known better. That I went into that process blindly taking our Silicon Valley, North American process, and with, with good collaboration and stakeholders and stuff, we just put a cloak on it, metaphorically. It didn't actually change the fundamentals of what that process was. And behind that is this assumption that what comes from the industrial west is inherently superior to what could exist and did exist here. So yeah, fuck that one up. <laughs> <laughs> now, sorry? I've got to finish. Oh, of course, yeah, you're not just letting me know. Thank you. <laughs> I'm out of time. I should have, I should have read it. <laughs> <laughs> But I think there's another way. See, the, the two centuries of sort of collision between Māori and Western civilization has led them to uh, they've been debased, debilitated. It's a pretty you know, shocking sort of transition. But it wasn't a straight line. Actually, until about 1860, Māori were doing bloody well, thank you very much. This cornucopia of materials, technologies, ideas, and they took them on board and they were in control of agriculture, food supply, transport infrastructure. In the 1860s what happened is uh, settlers with the British Army came in and destroyed that economic base and then set about systematically demolishing that approach, the, the whole communal base of, of Māori life. But there is that thing, they were bloody good innovators. They really took it on and they really succeeded. Now, I've spent some time in Tuhoi this year, and uh, where one of my old colleagues from my back is the Iwi chair. And I shared some of our process with him, and he's a very charismatic man. He looked and said, No, why do you think we would need that? Because there's a, an enormous amount of renaissance going on there. What they're doing, in my belief, is stripping back all of the shit that's happened since the wars and right back to those original um, creative processes that allowed them to succeed so well and reinventing their uh, world on the basis of that two cents in the dollar that we give them in treaty settlements. Now, I think that what we need to do in this area is actually go back and take that cloak off put the our European system on one side, uncover with help that original Māori creative process and hybridise the two as a real co-creation process. I think we have um, really only two options. To do that sort of thing in all sorts of contexts, particularly in the education one, or with a, a part in our gated communities and our slums. Yeah, okay.